Hey, Lindsay. Thank yeah, you. so um, I really liked your, your work there. I was wondering about the, um, so you have a, a, a couple of effects that, I don't know if, it, so I was just thinking about people who are sitting on the couch, right? So, so you've got this, and, and you know, carpeting and other things. So if you've got um, a lot of material that's starting to, to settle, it could collect in the couch. And I can imagine some big person sitting on the couch and an explosion uh, you know, of aerosolization of everything that's sitting there. We've actually... Have you, have you looked at these other things and the size of the people? I mean, someone with big shoes could also <laughs> you know, have a lot of volume of air under their feet. I, have you looked at these other... Or, and kids running around the house versus just walking gently. I mean, are these things that you, you can factor into your model. So the um, Andrea Farrell's group at Clarkson has probably done the most work on dust resuspension from walking. Um, I don't know if they've looked at kids running around, but I think they've considered people of different heights and, and kids maybe. Brandon Bohr at Purdue is starting to look at this question too with babies crawling and their exposure close to the floor. Um, we have actually thought about the couch problem. It's been more couch question. It's been more in the context of semi-volatile organic compounds which are absorbed to dust particles, but that would certainly happen with, a, with any microbes that are settled there too. You know, you can imagine if the 400-pound uh, the hacker sits down, then all of a sudden you get this big cloud of things that, that get uh, resuspended. Um, so yeah, that, that is something we've thought about. We haven't actually done anything in that, but it could be that that is these episodic types of, of releases are actually really very important um, for, for kind of determining the signature, I guess, of the airborne microbiome. Um, I, uh, my question is for Lindsay. Do you think, I, I like the idea of, of metagenomes for viruses in the built environment, but do you think that there's much to be gained from that other than, okay, so if you take out, so we're both engineers, so let's take out the bacteriophage question and just go for the human viruses. Is there much to be gained there? Are there new discoveries to be made um, or is it just going to be the same list of viruses that we probably think are going to be there? Well, I mean, you could, we could ask the same question about bacteria. Is there much to be gained from, from bacterial metagenomics and understanding the community that's there? I think there's the question of who's there, just in general, but that doesn't get at mechanisms or anything. Um, I think it's probably very important to an ecologist's point of view. I, I, there must be viral ecologists out there somewhere who study these types of things. Um, and so, but you know, kind of that's the easiest and most basic question, who's there? And then you can, I bet that would open up a lot of so. further follow-up questions. So I, I, we're very interested in trying to pursue that uh, when, the, when the technology. Lin Sorry, I, I want to pitch in here, but I did do a metagenome of an oh, indoor, yeah. yeah, a virus. And it was really interesting to find, so, so a lot of the metagenomics are DNA based. So you're going to find the DNA viruses unless you do reverse transcriptase to get the RNA, right? So there's a lot, but what we did find in our study and we, um, was that it was a, an enormous number of, uh, I think it was uh, different kinds of herpes viruses and HPV and skin, all sorts of skin DNA viruses were covering. A lot of them we hadn't seen before. And I think they're extremely hardy um, viruses that can move from person to person. I think they stick in the environment along. So this is one of the, I think it was the first virus metagenome that we've done and that alone was very interesting because I expected to find a lot of bacteriophage, but I think because it's skin and bacteriophage are probably not very common in the skin, you're finding actually a lot of human viruses that I, I, I frankly didn't expect. So it was, it was, you know, these were ones that actually hadn't been, you know, nothing, almost nothing known about them. So at the same time, the yeah, that's been published. Yeah, it was a small part of the of this ecological succession study in AEM. Um, so it got buried down in some of the um, on the finer work, but I think it was much more interesting. Uh, I, than that. that was really interesting work, and at the same time, though, we have to remember the databases for viruses are far more limited than those for bacteria, and they're probably biased towards human-associated viruses. So, you know, what's really out there, we, I don't, I don't think we really know because we, though they haven't been sequenced. Um. So this is a question for John, or it's it's more of a comment. Um, this has to do with the, the Ken Chong Kitafon paper you mentioned that, uh, that was looking at what we know about indoor asthma triggers. And uh, as far as I know, there's still no causal link drawn between indoor fungal exposures and asthma exacerbation. And what we tried to do in that paper was to distinguish 
um, what was known to be causal and what wasn't. And so in looking at the literature on outdoor measured culturable fungi, cultural airborne fungi outdoors, there seemed to be enough to say that that was a causal link. Indoors, traditionally, uh, the indoor airborne culturable fungi have had no consistent relation to any disease that's been studied. Uh, and I always thought it was because they were one and two and five minute samples, and so it was ridiculous to think that they represented what was in the room. But in this review, we found there were a number of studies that found clear relationships between indoor culturable airborne fungi, I think it was penicillium or total fungi, and asthma exacerbation, which was really shocking, because it didn't seem they could possibly be useful, those kinds of measurements. So the indoor, uh, indoor and, and the question was, everyone believes that allergic people who are sensitized to fungi can get asthma exacerbations from fungal exposures, but the question was, can indoors contribute I'm sorry, can fungi indoors cause that, or is it really just outdoor fungi that have come indoors? So this study, the studies we looked at carefully compared, you know, they adjusted the reactions indoors to the outdoor concentrations, and it wasn't enough to be causal. So that was just a suggestive association for indoor fungal exposures. Yeah, I had to leave that slide out to make it 15 minutes. But yeah, the, the, they were near significant, but they weren't significant, as I remember. And also the culturable, as I remember, there were only four species that they cultivated. Yeah. So the, sam the sampling is, you know, better sampling would be really nice to have. Right. Hi, I, I really enjoyed both of your talks. And uh, I have a sort of a general comment, which uh, segues into a question. So uh, I, I think that the approach, Lindsay, you had of, of quantitative, you know, reaction diffusion models for describing aerosol and settling and so forth. I think that's actually really important here because of what you want to get from a model like that is what are some key parameters that you need to measure in order to say something? In what circumstances can you treat a system as well mixed, what's called a mean field approximation, versus paying attention to all the, the gradients in the room and so forth? Uh, I think that's I think that's very important. I think that should mean your approach could apply to not just viruses but bacteria, fungi, and so forth. And speaking of those three, I'd like to hear your two thoughts about interactions between viruses and fungi, and bacteria, and so forth. You know, because uh, to what extent is a, a living room a, a, a seething ecosystem of interacting players? I don't know. I presented that as a future research challenge. I think there's the, you know, I think there's this probably secret life of microbes out there, mm -hmm. all kinds of drama, soap opera that's going on that we just, we, we have no idea what's about. And with the way we talk about microbes, we very, very much kind of, and the, I think the way the disciplines have been set up, it's there's a biologist, there's a virus person, there's a bacteria person, there's a fungi person, and they, they, the, you know, there's these boundaries where we don't talk about what's going on between them a lot. So I. I don't know, but I bet, I would bet that there's a, you know, there's these vicious competitions between them, or there's some symbiotic relationships and things. I'm, I'm sure you can speak more about that. Well, f first, I think in the in the living room floor, nothing's going on. I'm guessing because it's oh, not it's wet. Dry. But in the sinks or in the toilet or in the kitchen, yeah, or in the trash can or the potted plant, and we know we know now because of this the new tool of sequencing that there are many fungi that harbor bacteria. And the field of fungal virology is not as far advanced, but it's well known that there are virus and fungi. Uh, Double-stranded RNA virus is the classic one, but probably other ones. And it's known from the bacteria, um, and I think also from some virus in bacteria in fungi, that the phenotype of the fungus can change dramatically depending on the association. So there definitely could be um, associations, and whether they form in the sink or the toilet, I don't know but uh, it definitely could be there. But for most, for fungi, for mo most of the house is a desert and they're passing through unless they get wet. Um, I have a question for Lindsay. And in the early slides, and this just kind of gets to gross abundance of virus or virus-like particles is the, what you called it on your slide. And, um, can you clarify, you were staining air samples to get those virus-like particle counts? Is that what that 
the we early used, graphs that you showed with virus and bacteria on the same? Right, we used a uh, fluorescent dye, AJ, what was it? So cyber gold for genomic material, DNA and RNA, I believe. So this intercalates with DNA? Yes, and, and, what, Genom and RNA. So uh, much and like acrine orange, DAPI, it's just kind of a, another DNA. Yeah. So here's my question. I, I've looked at a lot of stained air samples, and counting bacteria in them is hard. And I, I'm just trying to get a sense for how confident are you in what, what the size cutoff and um, what degree of resolution or, or fluorescence intensity, or how did, you, how did you get some confidence around those numbers um, and the error bars that you showed and so on? And, and I'll, I'll start out and then I'll turn it over to AJ because he actually did the work. But um, the, we, we did filter, so we, we got the air samples into liquid and then ran them, the liquid extract through a membrane filter to remove the big stuff, 0.45 microns. So we were, then we were looking at just the smaller stuff, um, and, and then AJ can speak about the size, resolution, and fluorescence. And, so yeah. before you go, AJ, uh, after having looked down the microscope a lot, I start to lose my ability to determine what's round, what's a dot, what's anything at point We did automate four. this somewhat using ImageJ. Okay, and that, it's better than my eyes, that's for sure. But anyway, go ahead, AJ. So basically, we follow the exact same protocol that they've used to get the VLP counts in marine environments. We are just collecting an air sampling. You're right, the, they're virus-like particles. They're pinpoint dots under the microscope. And using ImageJ, we are able to set a cutoff value for the diameter. And I gotta go back and look at the paper about how many hundreds of nanometers that was. And anything that fell within that range, we classify as a virus-like particle. Is that, okay. Yeah, no, does I, that answer your question? I was curious. I, it could very well be free genomic material that's like associated with an abiotic particle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so semi-automated, you can set thresholds, and I, I was just curious how all that worked. And do you think you lost anything during filtration? Mm, it's possible. Well, did you, <laughs> did you sure spike did. anything? Did you add? influenza virus and see how much got through. Did you do anything like that? I'm just we curious how that. this is standardized. Mm -hmm. And that, that was subtracted from this and so on. Okay, great, thank you. So, so staying on the theme of methodology that, that Mark started here, Lindsay, you know that I discovered your work about the, um, the vehicles for lab study of virus behavior and the influence of humidity and temperature in the ongoing dialogue about seasonal flu, the, the so-called mystery. And I thought that what you reported was very important. I was hoping you'd talk about that okay. um, today. And, and also, um, if you could comment on, the, you know, there's sort of this general notion that more ventilation is good. What potential impact can ventilation and temperature and humidity in the indoor environment have on seasonal flu? We, uh, in one of the papers that I talked about today, we actually do have the, the one where I said we were modeling removal by gravitational settling, inactivation, and ventilation. I didn't show those results, the full set of results, but we actually do have ventilation. And ventilation in a public building where you might have 10 air changes per hour removes over 90% of, of the airborne viruses. It, or particles, I guess, in general, because it really applies to anything. Um, in a home, that removal is much, uh, much smaller, and it's actually the settling and inactivation that are more significant. <coughs> Does that answer your question? That was, that was kind of arbitrary. Uh, I think, you know, some kind of specification for what's recommended in public buildings, in certain types of public buildings. The, the ASHRAE standard would, would if implemented, which it isn't, Andy's done some good work that's shown that, would be on the order of eight, to, uh, eight tenths to one air change per hour for a standard kind of occupancy pattern, uh, three in a classroom, <coughs> and about five to seven in a public assembly or laboratory building. So, but in fact, they're obviously, and Andy's done a good analysis of the base data showing that ventilation rates in the majority of buildings are above the recommendation. But, but, but I was focusing on, on 
on the implications for laboratory study of the behavior of a virus about whether it's in water, mucus, or saline solution as it's released and how temperature and humidity affect that as one of the ways of understanding the seasonal flu problem. Yeah, so in one of our papers, we know that the flu is more prevalent and more, you know, the, we have this strong seasonality in temperate regions with the, the with peak in the winter time, and we think that has to do with the low indoor humidity, which b drops us below this threshold where we get complete evaporation of respiratory, of respiratory droplets or of the aerosolized virus, and it survives just fine in those conditions, and that really at these moderate humidities where we get the partial evaporation and the very uh, concentrated solutes that are not crystallized, so they're still impacting the virus viability, um, that in these moderate humidities, we are essentially kind of favoring inactivation of the flu virus, at least, and, and probably of other enveloped viruses. But that's, that's, so we do think that um, relative humidity is very important in affecting seasonality of the flu. And maybe, even, you know, if this is right, then you could say, well, maybe in the wintertime, if you're able to, make, when we have heating, if you're able to maintain a more moderate humidity rather than drying out the air, um, there's, if, if this is all right, maybe we could really uh, help reduce transmission rates of the flu. Two more questions, and then we're going to take a break. So in terms of looking for potential interactions between fungi and viruses and bacteria, or uh, maybe even abiotic or just other organic material in the built environment, what uh, methodological biases do we have to eliminate? So, for example, the filtering. If you guys are taking air, air samples and you're looking for airborne fungi or airborne viruses, you're going to be potentially doing size exclusion and, and filtering out a very specific particle size. So other than removing the filtering step, what, what else can we do to better get a more complete picture of where things are? Well, we've, in our freezers, we've all got these DNA samples and we've looked at bacteria, sometimes bacteria and fungi. We could start to look for virus in those. That would be, that would be a very useful thing, it seems to me. Yeah, and just to clarify on the filtering, I was talking about filtering out larger bacteria when, after we've gotten everything into a liquid. If you have a 0.45 micron filter and you're collecting an air sample, it's still going to collect things smaller than 0.45 microns with the 99% efficiency. Um, so that's just one important distinction between filters in air and filters in water. Um, other challenges, so yeah, with the filtration, you know, I mentioned about the, with viral metagenomics, uh, the databases are, are thin and biased, I'm sure. The, uh, another thing, people use PCR a lot. There are, when you're collecting air samples, there are inhibitors in um, the particulate matter, the abiotic material, um, and so kind of somehow removing those or I, better removing those, uh, you know, or to deal with the viral, the biomass problem, is there a way to, to amplify that somehow, um, you know, because they don't have the conserved gene region, so that, that's an area for potential advancement. I don't know. Great, yep. Yeah. So I was, I was wondering from both of you, it sounds like, um, John, you feel extremely confident that um, fungi are not um, metabolically active in the built environment unless there's, like in the carpet, for example, unless there's water available. So wondering from both of you, um, is that correct and what are the, um, what evidence do we have that uh, we don't have active ecosystems in the indoor environment unless water is available? And if we're not 100% confident of that today, what technology developments do we need to be able to um, answer that question? Where and why are ecosystems um, active in the indoor environment? I, I think... Um John's right in that if things are dry, nothing's happening. But it, the question is, you know, because you can have absorbed, you know, even absorbed mono layer of water, and maybe that's enough for things to be happening. So how much water do they need? Um, it, I think is kind of a, a question that we should be looking at. John. Well, <clears throat> fungi need water, and I'm, I can, I'm thinking, maybe you're thinking too, of your recent publication on the bacteria at Mount Bachelor in Oregon where you compared um, DNA to RNA 
and, and could argue that the bacteria were active because they had an excess of, of I guess it was ribosomal RNA. But there, I would say those bacteria are probably blown off conifer coniferous trees and they were probably active on the tree, but they may not be active in the air. So I think life needs water. You know, if you, if you look at the distribution of microbes globally or over the, over the United States, over North America, the big drivers are, are temperature and moisture. And it, you know, it, it, that shouldn't surprise us. So I think in a house, in a, in a water damaged building, no problem. Fungi are active, they're making the volatiles that Joan likes and all these other things. But if it's dry, no. Yeah, I, I, just one caveat, you know, you're speaking as somebody who's done a lot of the research in Berkeley, California, and uh, we're hearing from somebody who's living in a more moist climate. And I, who lived in New Orleans, have to say that there was a great deal of fungal activity um, in houses because of condensation. Oh, yeah. And so it, I think that the, the climate in which the, the indoor studies are done is made perhaps more important than we've done. It's one of the many variables. And uh, I guess I can ask one more question. I, my watch was faster than the clock up there, and we're supposed to break at 9.45. So let's let Jean have a question, and, and then, then we'll break. <laughs> So it's, a, it's just a, a can, carrying on this conversation rather than a, a, another question. So, um, you know, the health effects, adverse health effects at least, uh, from, from the fungi um, needn't be from viable fungi. I mean, it could be from uh, resuspended um, allergens or, you know, other inflammatory compounds. And then... Um, I would think that since they can survive, um, go into dormancy and, and survive dry periods, as soon as there is a little bit of water, they would grow again. So, it, it, I mean, I think it must come and go in cycles. It doesn't oh, you know, have to be Oh, absolutely. I'm not saying that, that they're dead, just that they're not active. But actually, at, at the moment, we don't even know if they're alive or dead in a lot of cases. Most, most studies don't. Um, or whether they're active. And, but certainly, fungi... You know, some fungal spores can persist, it appears, for a century um, desiccated. And then if they get wet, they can become active. And mycelium, too. So, you know, wood rot fungi. So, yeah, um, water doesn't have to be continually available for them to, to grow. And you're absolutely right that spores or pieces of, of fungal mycelium can act as allergens. And if, if we could get enough sampling, we could really nail that down, I think. More research. Okay. More uh, thank you very much. Excellent panel. Um, we're going to take a coffee break and then reconvene at 10 o'clock and focus more on the built environment and less on the, on the uh, microbial side. So uh, thank you very much and have time.